Joshua chapter 4, beginning at verse 1. When all the nation had finished passing over the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, Take twelve men from the people, from each tribe a man, and command them, Take twelve stones from here, out of the midst of the Jordan, from the very place <coughs> where the priest's feet stood, and carry them over with you, and lay them down in the place where you lodge tonight. Then Joshua called the twelve men from the people of Israel, whom he had appointed a man from each tribe. And Joshua said to them, Pass on before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of the Jordan, and take up each of you a stone upon his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of the people of Israel that this may be a sign among you when your children ask in time to come what do these stones mean to you then you shall tell them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord when it passed over the Jordan the waters of the Jordan were cut off so, these stones shall be to the people of Israel a memorial forever. Thanks be to God. Amen. May I speak in the name of God, who is revealed to us as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Ten days ago, I was in London and visited for the first time the recently unveiled and much overdue Bomber Command Memorial in Green Park. I found it intensely moving. In its centre, there are seven <coughs> nine-foot-high statues of a bomber crew of the Second World War. Could be a Lancaster, could be a Halifax, we don't know. The sculptor, Philip Jackson, has done, I believe, a brilliant job. The crew have just landed, they're still in their flying kit, and the looks on their faces are a mixture of relief and exhaustion. I think the technical medical term is knackered. <laughs> to my mind, a particular stroke of genius <coughs> is that you can't tell which member of the crew is which. Each depended on the others. And they're scanning the horizon for other aircraft from their operation and squadron returning from the operation. We know that those whom we meet to commemorate this afternoon were not among those who returned safely. The night of the 4th, 5th of March, 1943, was a relatively quiet night by the standards of Royal Air Force Bomber Command. The Battle of the Ruhr was yet to begin, and the war in Europe still had more than two years to run. At 18.38 hours on Thursday the 4th of March, a Lancaster of 100 Squadron, serial number ED549, took off from its base at RAF Waltham near Grimsby, one of the airfields of Number 1 Group Bomber Command on what was known as a gardening mission, mine lane to you and me. Its crew was, as so many crews in Bomber Command were in those days, a cosmopolitan group. Two from Canada, one from Barbados, and the other part four from various parts of the United Kingdom. <coughs> as was the way with Bomber Air Crew, they would have all gone through intensive training in their respective specialisms, whether as pilot, navigator, flight engineer, wireless operator, bomb aimer, or gunner in specialist schools before coming together as a crew. 
That coming together would have been through what seems to us now somewhat random process. They would have mixed together with other trained air crew and more or less selected themselves. <coughs> Once together, a crew would form itself into an integrated family where each looked out for the other and in which they would work together as a close team. It was this mutual dependence and trust that would often ensure their survival on operations, or, or OBS as they came to be called. The crew of this aircraft, ED-549, would have come together during their training by the same process of self-selection. They had completed their training and gone operational, where we can assume that as they were by this time an operation, on an operational squadron, they were integrated into a tight knit <coughs> team which, in which each depended on the others. As one veteran of bomber commanders put it, a former bomb aimer, you flew together like brothers. You met as strangers and soon formed as brothers, each relying on each other 110%. <coughs> the crew of ED-549 were Flight Sergeant General Russell Avey, pilot, Royal Canadian Air Force. Sergeant Benjamin Thomas Hallett, Flight Engineer, Royal Air Force. Sergeant Alan Havelock Spence, Navigator, Royal Air Force. Sergeant Greystoke Doyle Cumberbatch, from Barbados, Guamaymer, Royal Air Force. Sergeant John Robinson, Wireless Operator, Royal Air Force. Sergeant D.S. Davis, Air Gunner, Royal Air Force. And Flight Sergeant Rene Roger Landry, Air Gunner, Royal Canadian Air Force. These are the men we gather to remember and commemorate today. We know that they did not survive their mission, apart from one, on that March night 69 years ago. <clears throat> we know that early in the morning of the 5th of March 1943, Dennis Kirk, who is here with us this afternoon, was on ARP duty when he heard the sound of an aircraft approaching. It was obviously in trouble, and the engines sounded like they were out and they were starved of petrol. <clears throat> the aircraft passed overhead, then crashed about a quarter of a mile from Plunger in the direction of Langer Airfield. Dennis and his group rushed towards the scene to render assistance. <coughs> they found one dazed survivor on the railway line, Sergeant Davis. They asked him if there were any bombs on board, and he was able to reply that they had already been dropped. Sadly, all the other crew members they found were dead. A recently discovered piece of the aircraft, it's in the niche just there, <coughs> has shown damage from a cannon, cannon shell. So perhaps some crew members were either dead or wounded, which will explain why a bailout order was not given. The aircraft had already aborted two landings at other airfields and was obviously attempting to get in at Langer. It would appear that the pilot, Flight Sergeant Avey, his nephew John Avey is with us here this afternoon, towards the end of an eight-hour flight, was struggling to maintain height and control, which could indicate that the aircraft had discovered battle damage. Subsequent examination revealed a mechanical problem with the port inner engine. The crash is timed at 0308, Friday the 5th of March, 1943. Such are the bare facts behind a very human tragedy for the six families of those killed, and of course, for the likely, likely lifelong effects on the one survivor. Such sadnesses and tragedies were to be replicated in the homes of the 55,000 573 air crew of Bomber Command who were killed before the war ended, and in the countless homes of those who were injured, and in the memories of those now in their 80s and 90s who still survive, for whom the experiences they had in Bomber Command will be forever etched upon their lives. In the reading this afternoon from the Old Testament book of Joshua, we heard of the people of Israel finally crossing the river Jordan into the Promised Land. In chapter 4 of that book, we hear of how the water of the Jordan ceased to flow, something that happened from time to time, and this was taken as God's miraculous holding back of the waters 
so that the people could cross dry shod to their destination. It was interpreted as the action of God working for his chosen people. And after the twelve tri tribes had crossed, Joshua, their leader, instructed that twelve stones, one for each tribe, should be erected into a cairn as a perpetual memorial to God's mighty act, so that this may be a sign among you. When your children ask you in time to come, <coughs> what do these stones mean? Then you shall tell them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off from the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. So these stones shall be to Israelites a memorial forever. And it seems to me that when, people, when the people of these villages, children and adults, ask in time to come, what does this stone mean? We and succeeding generations will be able to tell them that it is a memorial forever to six great young men who died during their duty and through whose deaths we and they and their children after them will live in freedom and peace. That was 69 years ago. But we should also remember that as we meet, there are young men and women serving in a similar cause in the plains and mountains of Afghanistan who no less deserve our support and our prayers. This memorial and the recently unveiled long overdue Bomber Command Memorial in London serve to us and succeeding generations as reminders for all time of the sacrifice made by so many that we may live in peace. This evening, in the small Belgian town of Ypres, a ceremony will take place which happens every evening of the year. <coughs> the traffic will be stopped and the buglers of the Ypres Fire Brigade will form up in the middle of the road under the cavernous arches of the Menin Gate and sound the last post. This nightly salute is in memory of the soldiers of the First World War who were killed in the Ypres salient in that war and have no known grave. One of the things that strikes you when you stand in the huge ceremonial Menin Gate, apart from the grandeur of the architecture and the evocative echoes of the last post ringing round its arches, it's a seemingly endless list of names inscribed on the walls, stretching in apparently limitless columns up into the vaulting. There are upwards of 56,000 of them, very nearly the same number as those who were to die in Bomber Command in the second. And it's seeing these apparently endless list of names that bring the magnitude of the numbers home to me. This stone only has seven names, and they are no less valuable to those of us who remember them. As we this afternoon hear the strains of the last post echo around this lovely English country church, let us use it as an opportunity to give thanks not only for those we commemorate today, but for all who, past and present, lay their lives on the line for the sake of others. The Christian faith gives us an assurance that memories do not die, and that in the words of the book of Deuteronomy, the eternal God is our refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. Indeed, the Christian faith is based on belief in the resurrection, the resurrection of Christ, and the assurance that death is not the end, and that those everlasting arms are ready to receive those who die, not least those who have died in the cause of peace and freedom. It so happens that the day before the crew of ED 549 took off, Wednesday the 3rd of March 1943, I looked it up, was Ash Wednesday, the beginning of the church's season of Lent in which we recall, according to the Gospels, the time Jesus spent in the wilderness, the time of temptation, of confronting evil. The cause for which the Second World War was fought was also a confronting of evil, the wicked and perverse ideology of Nazism. Indeed, in one of his wartime speeches, Winston Churchill spoke of it as a struggle to preserve Christian civilization. The dark 40 days of Lent are followed by the celebrations and triumph of Easter. The second is not possible without the first. 
The young men we commemorate today, the average age of Bomber Command crews was 22, and who will be commemorated for all time at a field near here, where their aircraft crashed 69 years ago, were of that generation who were prepared to confront all the dangers they and their comrades faced night after night in the operations of Bomber Command. I believe they had faith in the eventual victory that they would help to bring about. Let us pray that we and our generation may follow their example of courage and dedication. When your children ask in time to come, what do these stones mean to you? You, the people of Plunga and the villages round about, will be able to tell them of these men and inspire them to be prepared to live for the sake of others as they did, and as did their Lord Jesus Christ, confident in the resurrection that is to come, the ultimate <coughs> triumph of good over evil.
shall grow not old, as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemned. At the going down of the sun, and in the morning, we will remember them. We will remember them.
between the nations, remembering with thanksgiving the sacrifices of those particularly whom we recall today. <coughs> Lord, in your mercy, we pray for the men and women of the Royal Air Force, past and present, particularly those serving in 100 Squadron at this time. We pray for those who are serving in areas of the world where there is conflict and tension. Lord, in your mercy, <laughs> we pray for all the forces of the Crown, for their allied forces serving in Afghanistan. We pray for the families who watch and wait at home, and for their safe return. Lord, in your mercy, <laughs> we ask, Father, for peace in our troubled and divided world, we remember before you the parts of the world where there is conflict, Afghanistan, Syria, the nations of the Middle East, all other parts of the world where people suffer as a result of war, particularly the injured and the bereaved. Lord, in your mercy, <coughs> we pray for those who work amongst those affected by conflict. We pray for the Royal British Legion, for the Royal Air Force of Benevolent Fund, the Royal Air Forces Association, and all service charities as they seek to bring about relief to those affected by war. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. we pray together for prayer on the uh, order of service, the Evans Prayer. <coughs> Pilot Divine. And Lord of all mankind, <coughs> and I of the starry squadrons of the sky, lead us from things to freedom and safety our soul, into our hearts by faith and courage for a living and a prayer. Set down our hearts to trust us today to be, and that we trust us for eternity. He replied with the sun shining, Sunward I climbed and joined the tumbling mirth of sun-split clouds 
and done a hundred things you have not dreamed of, wheeled and soared and swung high in the sunlit silence. Hovering there, I chased the shouting wind along and flung my eager craft through footless halls of air. Up, up, the long delirious burning blue, I've topped the windswept heights with easy grace, where never lark or even eagle flew. And while with silent lifting mind I trod the high untrespassed sanctity of space, put out my hand and touched the face of God. Faithful 
now and always. Amen. God grant to the living grace, to the departed rest, to the church, the queen, the commonwealth, <coughs> and all human kind, peace and concord, and to us and all his servants, life everlasting, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always.
Just look in front of you. Thank you very much. You got it so good. Thank you. Well no, done. No, I, I enjoyed it. Really. It's very well done. Nervous, yeah. though, you know. But I felt very alone now. Never mind. Okay. Well, you look seated. Looks at home. Absolutely. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Thank you. 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 Well done, baby. <laughs> oh, I didn't hear it. <laughs> 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 If that's the way you want to go. Oh, you was checking the people. I can call the Are you going to drive Another name there. Are you alright? Yes, yes, I can see it at the end of the day. <coughs> 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 Is that a Bolton of Bolton Bridge? It did hold the French, yes. Bolton Bridge. But I'm 85th, where's the 89th? Because here we are. Here we are. Nobody's perfect, are they? Nobody's perfect. Somebody in there doesn't know you either, doesn't it? You know, you, we all have burgers to eat. <laughs> oh, come on, now, that's not fair. <laughs> <double-fashioned. laughs> <laughs> 